going to um, share with you a little bit of my own journey about how we've come from different places, but we're all kind of moving to an area. What Michael's story showed, I think, is where we're all trying to go to. And it's been a difficult um, process to get there. I started in this field in 1975. So I had gotten out of college. Um, I had done some work in psychology, learning theory. Anyway, um, what was going on was I was working with kids with autism and um, entered into the field. And of course, what we did then was we put kids with autism all together, like we kind of still do now. And um, this is a group picture. If you look closely, you'll see the kids are pretty miserable, um, not very happy at all. I mean, putting everybody with autism together, when you think about it, autism has social relationship issues and pervasive language issues and stereotypical behavior. And you know, what do we do? We put all those kids together who have social issues. You know, you're not making eye contact with other people. Here's a bunch of other kids who don't make eye contact with other people. It's like, not sure that makes sense. Anyway, I'm, I'm right over here. I'm the guy with the dark hair, 35 years in the field. For those of you who don't know, this is what happens. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it, it was difficult because um, we didn't really get anywhere. I began working with adults after that because I realized, you know, a lot of people were coming out of the institution. And I ran an agency that served adults with disabilities. And we had huge, large group homes. And one of the first things I tried to do was get people out of these big, large group homes. And we set up apartments with one or two people per apartment. And I would make, make a point of going out to dinner and um, visiting folks. And, but of course, you know, it was still kind of flawed because we still had group homes. And when it was time to get recreation, the group homes would pile everybody in a van and go to the mall where there was some sort of mall therapy going on, of which I don't even understand. Apparently, mall therapy is big in community programs. I don't know what it does, but um, I do know that everybody at the mall stayed the heck away from this group of people because they looked kind of different and they were all together. It was like a giant disabled amoeba in the mall going down and wasn't really working very well for inclusion. And of course, what else do we do? We went bowling because bowling is what people with disabilities love to do. I don't know where we got that idea. I do know I drive the van to the bowling alley, and it was a mess because people were coming off the van. They were crawling under the van. People were running across the street because they saw Dunkin' Donuts. Everybody into the bowling alley, and people saw us coming. And they would go out the back door because it was kind of a zoo in there, people throwing their shoes at the pins. It was just, it was interesting but, um, and fun. but. We would have the nerve to mark people, community included, when they came back as some sort of inclusion experience. Um, not really getting it. This is my workshop. We had a workshop, among other things. Uh, again, that's me. You notice everybody's holding their trophies and awards and looking happy. Me, I'm very worried because I am sure Marie holding the trophy, who's got anger issues, was going to <laughs> clobber the person underneath her. And then we would have trouble. And we'd have it documented, probably, too. Now, the people in that workshop all loved the workshop, all said they would, you know, they worked there for years. Um, we eventually got everybody out, got people into jobs. And uh, that was not an easy process. It was a difficult process. And it took a long time. Uh, but the agency doesn't run that workshop anymore. And a lot, a lot of this process has to do with some of what Michael was saying about discovery. And, and you know, we were kind of flailing at that point, not sure how to do it, but we've learned a lot about then. What we do know is we were making a mistake about thinking about when people were ready. When are you ready to live on your own? When are you ready to get a job? When are you ready to be able to go out in a community and do things in the community? And we thought you had to pass some sort of criteria. And we would write goals and objectives and give people things to master, like sorting and color sorting and hardware assembly. And what we ended up doing was having lots of bored people who then would kind of show us behavior issues. And that would lead to these behavior SWAT teams coming in and you know, running up programs. And, and it was just this never-ending cycle. And it was very difficult. Um, of course, we don't do this today. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we still have a lot of people doing readiness training, um, not for pay. Um, they're just activities to see when you're ready for employment. Uh, that really doesn't work never has, and we need to step away from things like that. Is, does it make sense to help people prepare? Sure. But the way you do that is not with simulation. The way you do that is by participating in real life kinds of activities. 
Um, we actually sell these things. We see these things in catalogs. You know, you can have a musical top for thirty for twenty five dollars. Uh, twenty five dollars? I mean, go to Toys R Us. It's three bucks. Uh, but it's no. I guess it's because it maintains attention. <laughs> for how long? I don't know. Anyway. I think part of the problem is we are so trained to look for deficits and to fix the deficits that we don't give people the opportunity to experience life the way we talk about through discovery. In fact, I do a lot of training of, of different agencies around North America and other places, and I always use this as a, a case example for people to see what they come up with. Um, this is a real person with these kinds of labels based on assessments. This person needs to reduce noncompliance and other socially maladaptive behaviors. This is a male. Actually a sexual exhibitionist, which causes all kinds of problems in community settings. Some tongue thrusting, uncontrollable, skips childlike, maybe there's a Tourette's there, who knows, unpredictable, needs to be the center of attention, so it's got some behavior issues, sometimes has these dark urges, views women as objects, very kind of sexist in that way, and very weak social skill development. And when I ask people, what are you going to do? Would you accept this person in your program? A lot of people say, he can't, he's not ready to come into our program, too many issues. Well, what kinds of services would you provide? Well, probably a behavior program that uses timeout. Um, one, one group decided they were going to use aversives like Listerine, so when he stuck his tongue out, they'd spray Listerine on him, and that would make his tongue go back in. People were on psychotropic medications. The list went on and on and on. Everybody agrees, however, that this person at this point in his life is unemployable. He's going to need long-term skill training and needs to get rid of all of these deficits. Now, when everybody's done with this, I ask them, do they know actually that they were working on someone that everybody probably knows that this person you're refusing to let work, his name Mick Jagger, and Mick is doing just fine, thank you. So the thing is, we get so focused on deficits. We refuse to look at the context with when, how we label these things and where we can do that. Can you imagine what would have happened to this guy? If we tried to get him into your program, it's a miracle he's still alive. So the point is, I guess, over these 30 years, we've made a lot of progress. And I don't want to kind of you know, put that down. It's very important we acknowledge that. We now have a situation where life planning, and life planning includes discovery. And that process is positive, and we know how to do it. Sometimes it's a little time consuming, but it's important to do. We know how to do supported living. We don't have a need for giant institutionalization of home living, whether institutions or intermediate care facilities or giant group homes. That's not a good solution for housing for people with disabilities. We know people can work in real jobs and don't need facilities to solve their unemployment, and that we have to view them as employable and figure out where their talents are and get them into good job matches with the right supports. We know that we don't have to be indispensable caretakers with people in their lives. Instead, we need to be more of a facilitator, connecting people to those in their life or who are going to be in their life, whether it's on the job, in their neighborhood, at their church, their friends, their co-hobbyist people, whatever. We need to connect people and deliver supports whenever possible through what the community offers in whatever way possible. We obviously need to focus more on community. The default setting should be community, not program. People don't need shelter workshops. People don't need group homes. People don't even need supported employment or customized employment. What people need are jobs and homes. The way we deliver and help people attain those things might be through some of these other things, but that's not what people need. People need jobs and homes and friends and a quality life. And how we choose to deliver that says a lot about our own training and capabilities and beliefs and values. Like I said, I ran a sheltered workshop. I drove the van to the bowling alley. I worked at institutions. I used be rather controlling behavioral practices. Very few of those things helped people. They seemed to control and contain issues. 
But a lot of times those issues were a result, boredom, fatigue, health, what we taught. I was once brought in when I was a behavior specialist. Um, I don't use that term to describe myself. It's in remission and I, don't, I control it pretty well. But at one point, I was asked to come in and look at a group of behavior problem people. And they were in a pre voc training program. They were all lined up. I said, well, what's wrong? These people will take a look. People are throwing their materials down. People are screaming and yelling. People are being aggressive. People are leaving their assigned area, for God's sake. Is there a bigger sin than being out of your assigned area? By the way, you've been in this field too long. If you go home and tell people they're out of their assigned area, if you tell your kids they're being inappropriate, nobody else talks like that. This is a human service thing. So, well, what's going on here? Well, this person, they're doing vocational training, and they have a pile of papers, and they've got to trifold them. Then they give it to this person who takes the trifold and put it in an envelope. Give it to this person who seals the envelope up, stacks them up. And then this person who unseals the envelope, throws it out, and makes the paper stack up again. What is wrong with this picture? Well, we need a timeout room. We need a behavior team. We need a behavior program. We've got to have reinforcement schedules. Well, maybe people are just pretty bored. Maybe what they're doing, well, what are they doing? Well, she's throwing stuff on the floor when she gets in, and he's leaving his chair. That's out of a signed area, and he's ripping stuff up, and she's being aggressive to the person next to her. Not very appropriate behaviors, but if you didn't have a good way of communicating, and you had to do this day in and day out, how many of you would be doing all of those things? I would be doing all four. First thing I would be doing is, I don't want to do this stuff anymore, and I'd be throwing it on the ground. If that didn't work, I'd be ripping it up. If that didn't work, I'd be out of there. I'm out of my assigned area. And if that didn't work, I'd be slugging the guy who keeps giving me the crap I just finished. <laughs> I can understand all of those things. Maybe the solution isn't a behavior program. Social inclusion is what it's about. Now, it isn't just being in environments like we thought, going to the mall, going to the bowling alley. It's being a participant among friends who also don't have to have disabilities. It's because we share interests, because we both like bowling, we both like photography, we both like going to the library, we both go to church. We both need to shop. And then you're in social inclusion. And how society views people it has to be understood as well. Society is, you know, interesting about how it puts value on people and how it devalues people. And when people are different, and that difference isn't necessarily valued by people, then you're labeled. And that label becomes awfully difficult, and you get stereotyped, and then there's discrimination. So what's had to happen for people with disabilities is some sort of advocacy and self-determination, having the ability to make good choices and informed choices. And that requires a lot of work on our part. So instead of saying, well, here's your informed choice, you could be in the shelter workshop or sit at home. Or you can go to this group home or this group home. We're stuck in that box where we think what we have to provide has to be within that box. It's the hardest thing to break out of. I know, because I ran programs that made those boxes. And breaking out of those boxes is the most difficult thing to do. Funding and policy and legislation and, and you know, policy makers telling us how to do it and when to do it. It's, it's hard to do. Parents, people not having the experience. So it's not easy to scale these things up. But this list I just gave you does give us hope, right? Hope for what's possible. We know how now and we know the way to do it. The problem is Hope has only been offered to very few people. See, those stories that Mike have and that I have as well, they're not representative of, by far, the majority of people we serve. They give us hope because we can show what's possible for people. The problem is the numbers and scaling up on a policy level, on a systemic level, is very, very difficult to do, especially when you work within these boxes we've made. So, you know, we talk about good jobs and good homes and friends and social inclusion. The truth of the matter is I can go anywhere in any part of any province or state and still find facilities with people in them 
working for very little money, doing work that doesn't necessarily match their interests, but is what we could provide. And with the exception now of a few states and a few parts of the United States that I'm aware of that have actually gotten out of facility-based employment, we still find this, by and large, everywhere, everywhere I go. Um, that's despite research, good, solid research. Now, we know shelter workers earn less and cost more to serve than comparably placed people in non-sheltered workshops, in, in employment settings. We have good data with good numbers. And what individuals learned in the workshops didn't improve their employability. I mean, that's why we said, that's why we had our workshop, was after time, practice work skills, you're more employable. Turns out there's no relationship to the amount of time you spend in a workshop and employability. Zero. In fact, the opposite is shown to be true. The longer you spend in a workshop, the less employable you're likely to be. Not good news for those of us who ran workshops. So what do you do with that information? Well, if you're me, you get pretty uncomfortable. And you, mark, you have to start making changes. This is a, a one that came out just a couple years ago. 10,000 workers, roughly, in shelter work and support employment match for gender and level of functioning, disability label, and a few other you know, blind double match study. Participation in workshop actually reduces the amount of work and wages. Policymakers, this is a quote out of the study, can substantially reduce costs by keeping individuals' disabilities out of shelter workshops altogether. Now, when you have research that points this out, it puts the pressure on policymakers and on providers to figure out what are we going to do with this. And so we come up with alternatives. Now, we have to be careful because if you closed all the workshops tomorrow, if you closed all the group homes tomorrow, you'd have people who were homeless and people who were jobless and they'd be out on the street or sitting at home with nothing to do if they had a home to go to. So we've got to be planful about it and figure out how to help people move through this. The problem is the gaps keep keeps getting bigger. This data went through 09, and I just got the newest batch, another two years of it, and it's pretty much parallel. So what we have here is in the late 80s, we saw this line going down, and this is people in sheltered work facilities, and supported employment was a steady rise. Now, if you figure we project that out, these lines would eventually meet, and we'd have more people in employment, less people in sheltered work, but that hasn't happened. And by the mid-90s, the gap just started to accelerate and it's gotten bigger and bigger and now it's running about parallel. What that means is that every day that goes by, every person who gets a job through supported employment, customized employment, whatever you want to use, three or four people have gone into a facility, which means the gap gets harder and the numbers get harder year after year after year. The percentage of people who have employment hasn't changed in the last 10, 12 years people with significant disabilities or people even with not as significant disabilities. That's troubling because the government spends gazillions of dollars to find people employment. But we haven't budged the employment rate, which is why we've got to now get moving on this and make some commitments. Not because people are telling us to, because it's the right thing to do. There's no reason now with what we know to sit back any longer. But I have to say, it's not easy. Like I said, if you look at the bar chart, you look at the pie graph, you look at whatever, you're going to see these figures year after year after year. This is what has to change. Try not to be any less clear about this. Now, the problem is we've been focused on groups, like kids with autism, like adults with autism, like adults with Down syndrome. Once you get labeled by our system, which you have to get right away, you can't just get services, you have to have a label. And once you have that label, it's like the human service vacuum cleaner takes you right out of your community and puts you in a program that fits that label. You have Down syndrome, you're going over here. You have cerebral palsy, you're going over here. Autism, over the autism program. Oh, behavior problem. We're going to put you with five other behavior problems where you can learn new ways of putting chairs through windows. <laughs> How smart is that? The problem is, and I did a lot of research and study about trying to understand, it was in social psychology, you know, when I went to school, social psychology really was a humanity, and now it's really a science. 
and, and it's changed a lot over the years. And what we learn is a very basic thing. When people are devalued and have stereotypes, and certainly people with disabilities qualify, how do you overcome that? And what might get in the way? Well, what might get in the way is when you make individuals who are different look more different. Now, sometimes that's a good thing if you want to do advocacy. It's called pride, right? Pride in my race, pride in my religion, pride in my disability. But if you want to be accepted into communities just for who you are and not make that the primary thing of what you are, the disability, I'm a person who has this, this, and this and has a disability, well then artificial things, labels, jargon, people with clipboards following you around in the bowling alley, having a van with a giant wheelchair on it. These are artifacts that make you look more different. And we can go on and on into how that works, but one of the things that I learned is that group people of like difference together exaggerates the difference. And that makes sense. And that can be good for advocacy, but not so good when you want to meet somebody who shares other personality traits that you're interested in. And it leads to stereotyping, which leads to discrimination. You look at these people, you see them working, but you don't see employees who are capable of working. You see a disabled work crew. And that's the problem with all our group approaches, a big part of the problem. So what we've done is looking at discovery and looking at individualized placement and looking at job development and looking at supported living as individualized approaches. And one of them is an employment first, which is taken over by storm in the US in terms of letting the default setting not be on a facility or a program, but on what kind of job do you want. That our expectation is you are going to have a job right out of school, right out of graduation, or if you're now in a workshop, our default setting is employment. What are we going to do and how is it going to take us to get there? What do we have to do to make that work? And that's basically the underpinning of employment first. Now this goes right up against some of our provincial, some of our state policies. It says, okay, you have services and here's a list. You can take one from column A and one from column B. And column A says group home and column B says sheltered work, supported employment. It means getting rid of the list. Instead of picking one, our evidence shows that we can best spend taxpayer money in getting you into employment, community employment that's integrated and individualized. And that's all employment first really is. The preferred outcome, not just the choice. And so the blue states, the darker the blue, the more along they've gotten in employment first. And some of these things are now written into state legislation in the US. Some of those I know provincial governments are doing the same and looking at it. And it does require a shift in thinking. Now it's not without flaws. There's not without, there are issues with this and how some um, provincial bodies and state bodies may be implementing this. So we gotta be careful because sometimes people embrace ideas but don't do them all the way through and they get perverted and then they don't work and they say, see, we tried that, it didn't work. And that's what we gotta avoid in this case. So all I'm trying to do with this message today in the brief time we have is to tell you that we can't basically justify segregation based on disability label, just like we can't base it on any other label as the way to solve people's needs and issues in life. When we segregate, it's just like grouping. If you immediately have grouping and then you have stereotyping, exaggeration of difference, and you have barriers. Segregation means going to a program that by definition will only take people who have your disability label. That's segregation. And we do that in our service system. What we need to do is to look at people and what their needs are and then their skills and put the skills before the needs and then figure out what the supports have to be. And if those supports don't come from our agency because it's in a box, how are we gonna get them? And what do we have to do to get them? Segregation can't be justified because morally, as I said, it's wrong. But the other thing is, it doesn't work. We don't have any evidence to say that going into these facilities are doing people good. Now some people say they're happy there. 
And some people say it's my choice to be there. But I went through that with the institutionalization way back in the 80s when my first job when I moved into New England was to try to get people out of an institution. And I thought I'd be the white knight riding in to save some people. Boy, did I learn real quickly when people, and about 30% of the people I worked with said, I don't want to leave. You don't want to leave. Look at this place. Look at your life. You have no possessions. You live on a ward with 40 other people. They hose you down at night. What do you mean you don't want to leave? Well, you've been in a place for 40 years. It's all you know. It's scary out there. And it took a long time to let people reach a point of informed choice, what it really means to live outside these walls. So when people say, you're taking away my choice by removing facility or large group homes, I actually say you're darn right. That's the role of taxpayer-funded services is to set parameters about choice. We should be paying for things that are efficient, effective, and help the person to the best possible way, in the best possible way. Why should money be spent on institutions when we now have a half, I don't know, 14 states now in the District of Columbia in the US, I don't know how many of the provinces, no longer have them, and studies show people are doing better. Why continue to fund them then? But you're taking away my choice. Yep. It's what we do. It's what services are all about, to find what choices make sense. Can segregation be justified? Well, another way of looking at this is, OK, what if we had no other choice? Well, that's not the case here. We know how to get people jobs. We have 30 years of evidence-based practice, things like discovery and matching and job placement and all those things. We know how to do it. We know how to find housing. We know how to do shared life planning. We know how to do person-based planning and to do discovery. And they don't cost any more because our cost effectiveness studies of these practices show sometimes you get a better outcome for less money. One person, one job. When you start compromising that, you're grouping people based on something related to disability. Member grouping emphasizes the disability. I helped start one of the first enclaves of supported employment in this area of New England, and boy, was that a mistake. I helped start one of the first work crews in New Hampshire. The problem is, I think it's still going. All those people would have been better off and better served if they had taken the time to do discovery and found an individualized job. So I would say this cannot be our solution to unemployment problems. Do you know any other minority group that has high unemployment that would put up with this idea? We're going to build you a big building and bring in work. And if the work isn't there, we'll do practice work. But we only pay you for what you produce. So you might make less than minimum wage. How's that sound? I think you'd have a riot on your hands. But this is what we do for people with disabilities. This can't be our solution. You have a disability, therefore you fold clothes. You have a disability, therefore you sort hardware. You have a disability, therefore you do clerical tasks. You have a disability, therefore you do cleaning. Where did that come from? Oh, they like it. They like boring, repetitive work no one else likes to do. Where did you get that? When I look up Down syndrome, I don't see that anywhere. Quality jobs are possible with social inclusion. This can't be our solution to housing. You can't really see this, but I don't know if your closet looks like this, where everything's stacked up perfectly and the, the file for the service records are up above. And man, you open my daughter's closet and stuff explodes out there. You could just tell this is a program. This one with the, the toilets, three stalls. But for convenience sake, they took out the privacy petitions in the middle. If that isn't a symbol of the lowest common denominator thinking, I don't know what is. When quality homes are so possible, we know how to do this. The problem is, and I'm going to end with this, is that we have trouble breaking the chains of our own thinking in our own boxes. We use the labels, we use the jargon. We go everywhere and people say, I would go into an employment site the other day and the person was upset and the supervisor came running over, what's wrong? And she was crying and throwing stuff to the ground and yelling and, and the job coach was there and answered her this way. He said, oh, 
He's having a perseverative behavioral outburst. Perseverative behavioral outburst. You want to scare the crap out of somebody, you tell them they're having a perseverative behavioral outburst. That is what makes people stand out weird, our jargon. You get mad, you get upset, you get pissed off. People with disabilities have perseverative behavioral outbursts. And that kind of shows us the issues we have. So we've got to break out of the jargon. We've got to start thinking in ways that help challenge us to look at ways to help people, whether it's discovery, supported living, employment, what have you. And it's hard. You get stuck in that paradigm of this is all I know. I'll share one brief story with you before I leave. Um, I do a lot of work in Australia and also, as Mike said, in Europe. Um, I was in London just there recently, um, although this happened a little while ago. And uh, I was doing some work and what happened was I met um, one of the people there and she proceeded to tell a story about her and her husband who live in London and she said, you know, my husband loves gardens and everybody in London, even though it's a city, we all have little gardens in our yard. And this is his favorite thing was the garden and he'd go out every day and work in his garden. And he also loves birds and one day he was out working in his garden and he heard an owl. He's like, is that an owl? And so he hooted to see if the owl would hoot and the owl hooted back. And so he was just dumbstruck. He said, this is great. And he hooted and the owl would hoot. And he checked his watch. He said, I'm going to come out here the same time tomorrow and see if this owl will show up. So after work, you know, it's dusk and he's out working in the garden, looks at his watch, hoots, the owl hoots back. Well, this became the favorite part of his day. His wife said he loved it. He'd go out, look forward to it, work in the garden, hoot, the owl hoot. He just took such pleasure out of this. And it went on for months and months and months. And she said, one day in my neighborhood, some of the women got together for coffee and tea, and, you know, and we all got together and we were talking. And so I started telling the story about how lovely it was. And one of the women next to me looked at me really weird and said, I said what's wrong? She said, my husband does the exact same thing. <laughs> and they found out they were doing it at the same time. And it turns out for the past so many months, these two guys have been hooting to each other. <laughs> now here's the interesting thing. Here's evidence. They come back and say, you know, I just met, and, and both husbands refuse to believe their wives. You're crazy. You think I don't know an owl? I know an owl when I hear an owl. That's just some guy over there He's making up a story. I, every rationalization you can come up with, and to this day, they're still hooting to each other as far as I know. In the face of evidence, once we believe something, it becomes very difficult to get out of. And so don't be someone in this conference who will hoot to owls when you know there isn't an owl there. Break out of that mindset. Have a great conference, and I look forward to seeing you all in my session. Thank you very much.